Genshin Impact has been out for three years now, and one of the first things people wonder when hearing about it these days is whether they've missed the party. It's a valid question, since Genshin is a live service game which places a lot of focus on its time-limited events, and the community is always talking about new characters or the latest chapters in the story. The sheer variety of content types and different niches within the game can make it overwhelming for new players to really understand, and it can be unclear to them which things are permanent and which are transient. So if someone were to start playing the game today, how would their experience differ? What exactly would they miss out on? What would their disadvantages be? and are there any advantages to starting now? Or is it just too late to start playing Genshin? First, to get it out of the way, it is absolutely not too late to start Genshin. While it has a co-op mode which can be a ton of fun, it is very much a single player game and will never be too late to start playing. But it can still be a little bit intimidating to take that first step. People like to know what they're signing up for. If any veteran travelers notice something important missing, please leave a comment down below. I personally missed version 1 completely and played the catch-up game to a smaller degree when I started as well. Plus there's a ton of ground to cover. Let's start with a look at Genshin's content schedule since the newest thing will always get the most attention and hype. The first thing to notice is that we have a rough idea of how long the main storyline will last. The initial reveal trailer listed 7 nations in the world plus an 8th which is a little more complicated. The first two nations were released at launch and since then we get one nation per year as the game's protagonist travels across the world. This means we have just started part 5 of 8 so there's a heck of a lot still to come and if Genshin remains even half as popular as it is now I would be very surprised if Hoyo decides to end the story there. Genshin releases updates on a regular schedule with each patch lasting 6 weeks and they always include a variety of things. The most significant content which gets released are the new regions in the open world, new chapters in the central storyline and major time limited events. Each patch includes one or two of these, for example version 4.1 included both a new region to explore and new chapters progressing the main storyline. New regions and Archon quests are permanently available while the major events such as Genshin New Year Festival are only available for a short period of time and are gone forever once their time is up. So far, there has also been one major limited time event each summer which includes a new area to explore temporarily. The regions added for these summer events are completely new maps which are only available during their event. Every patch also includes a whole host of other content. Often the most talked about are the gacha banners which change every three weeks. The five star characters available are usually ones who make an appearance in that patch's major story arc or events, and while character banners do repeat over time, it can take many months before those characters become available again. There are also always several smaller time limited events of varying significance, which can range from engaging mini games through difficult combat challenges to just getting some extra rewards from a regular in game resource farming. Many of these do repeat. The more mundane they are, the more regularly they rerun. Everything else added is permanently available. Most patches include new world questlines, new bosses or other enemies to fight, new domains, new recipes, new achievements and so on. They also often include a new story quest exploring one major character's backstory or a hangout quest for a less important character. Some patches even introduce a new game mode such as the trading card game, though these little side games like TCG and the Serenity Pot are completely optional. Generally speaking, while the time-limited content is the most eye-catching, it's a smaller part of the available content than might seem at first glance. So that's a lot of content. If you start right now, it will likely take you months of regular play to catch up on everything released so far. So what exactly will people starting now have missed out on? For me, the most disappointing thing is that some parts of character backstories or other key lore were included in time-limited events. For example, the 2022 summer event had some fantastic exploration of Fischl, Kazuha, Mona and Jin Yan, and new players will only ever be able to experience those parts of their story by watching a past playthrough on YouTube. Similarly, the big events can often be quite memorable experiences. Lantern Rite is always a highlight for example, and I feel sad that new people will not experience the Parade of Provenance event, which had some of my favourite character interactions between the Sumeru cast and really helped make the world feel alive. 
hopefully Hoya will allow some form of replayability for past events someday, just so people can experience these parts of the story firsthand. There are a few I missed due to starting later, which I'd love to see for myself. The other significant loss would be all the special rewards given out for those past events. Time-limited events give a variety of different rewards and they're often quite valuable. There's a regular cadence of events which gives a copy of a specific 4-star character or a one-off weapon which can be a huge win, especially if you're a free-to-play player. There was also Aloy, who was added as a free crossover character from Horizon series, who is no longer available. She's the reason I started playing and is definitely a little underrated, but is sadly underwhelming in Genshin overall. Still, as she is one of my all-time favorite video game characters, I'd be sad if I couldn't have her. Other event rewards are less impactful on your account, often more of a fun thing to have. For example, floating companions like the Octo Baby or gadgets like the fireworks launch tube. Whenever new character outfits are released, the outfit for the 4-star character is available for free as well. The outfit is still available after the event but costs real-world currency to buy. Aside from that, really the rest is just missed banners and missed time investment. It can be sad to miss out on wishing on a character you like, but characters do come back around, and the ones who are particularly popular are ones who are most likely to come back sooner rather than later. Rewards like leveling materials and artifact build up over time, so there's always the feeling that you'd have progressed more in the game if you'd started earlier, but for that, it's just important to remember Genshin is not a race, and it really doesn't matter if people who started earlier have stronger characters than you. Putting aside the fact that disadvantage in Genshin is a questionable concept in the first place, what would those disadvantages be? The most glaring one at this point is that you're far less likely to have high constellations for 4-star characters. Each time you get an extra copy of a character, it unlocks new abilities for that character, up to a maximum of constellation 6, or C6 for short. The number of characters has grown over time, and as a result, the chances of getting any specific one have slowly decreased. This is compounded by the fact that several of the 4-stars released early on in the game were significantly more powerful than any who have been released since. It's rare for early game players to lack constellations for these key characters, while newer players may find themselves struggling to get to their later constellations. Thankfully, very few characters truly require constellations to be enjoyable, and even some of those who have a reputation for being poor without them are actually still pretty great with no constellations at all. Lots of external content, guides in particular, start from the assumption that you have a strong account. It's often expected that you have those early game 4-star characters at C6, and much of the advice of teams and strategy simply doesn't apply if you happen to lack those characters. The same can be said for weapons, artifacts, and so on. This is where many guides fall down, since they tell you what stats to aim for without telling you why, which makes it difficult to understand how to apply their advice when you lack the resources they assume you have. Genshin's complexity makes it extremely difficult to provide general advice which applies to everyone, which is why I've approached my Genshin Explained series of videos from a slightly different angle, with the intent to make the underlying reasons understandable, rather than focusing so much on the quick and easy answers. Another issue which can be very frustrating is that it's possible for early game players to unlock characters who require materials which are unavailable until much later on in the game. Each character requires different materials to unlock certain levels, and there are some specific ones which are completely inaccessible until you've completed a large portion of the early story content. The worst offenders here are materials from Enkonomiya, which are not available until later on in the Inazuma arc. Fortunately, the materials from regions released after Inazuma are accessible right from the start, and in some cases it can be possible to obtain those problem materials in co-op. Plus, most of the characters affected by this would be more or less usable up until you reach that point, so it's not as bad as it could have been if this problem had continued on in Fontaine and beyond. Hopefully, Hoyo will add a way to fix this for those characters whose materials are locked. For example, allowing boss material training with an NPC in Mondstadt would be fantastic for early game players without having any real downsides. In my opinion, the biggest actual disadvantage you would face is feeling that you're missing out or that you're playing catch up. When there's a fun event which is locked to users who have reached a certain level, it can be tempting to burn through the content to level up and unlock that event. This can be worth it when the event provides great rewards, but tends to dampen the enjoyment you'd get from the early game content, since you pay less attention to it than it might deserve. 
For some, this continues on into late game as they see people discussing the latest content or posting about their ridiculous damage numbers. It's a ton of fun to be up to date and be part of the conversation reacting to the latest chapters of the story and speculating about what will happen in the future, but I would wholeheartedly say that it's less important than taking your time and immersing yourself in the fantastic content which already exists. Far better to take your time than to speed through the content and then have nothing left to do. And as to people's damage showcases, damage in Genshin is exponential and there's an inflection point where your damage numbers suddenly skyrocket. But even beyond that, again, this is not a competitive game. Many people have played for a long time and have characters powerful enough that the game offers little to no challenge, so they subconsciously turn it into a new game to have the best characters who do the most damage. This is a perfectly valid thing for people to enjoy, but it's not the only way to play the game, and it's just as valid to ignore all the numbers and just spend your time enjoying playing with your favorite characters, even if they're Carver. On the flip side, there are in fact some noticeable advantages to starting now. The sheer volume of content can be a big advantage. If you can avoid giving in to FOMO, you'll have literal months of increasingly fantastic content to play through, so you won't have the feast and famine experience which caused many to get tired of the game early on. Much of the game is also far better understood now, and some misconceptions from early days have been proven to be incorrect. You're more likely to find comprehensive guides and tools to help figure things out, and if you want to dive deeper into the mechanics of the battle system, there's a whole world to explore there. New characters with unusual playstyles have occasionally caused the community at large to fall into a doom cycle, where people talk in circles about how awful a character is, only for everyone to realize months later that their playstyle was just misunderstood and they're actually fantastic. This has happened with some of the best characters in the game, Bennett, Raiden and Kokomi to give three notable examples, who were all fantastic even when they released, despite the popular opinion. There have also been times when a character was objectively underwhelming at first, but turned out to be brilliantly designed for upcoming features. Kuki is the perfect example, a slight disappointment on release, but one of the best characters in the game once Dendro Element was added. It's perfectly fine to just vibe and play however feels right to you, but the fact that there's all this deeper world of understanding which you can dip your toes into when you choose to can make the game all the more compelling. The game itself has also improved. There are some quality of life upgrades which make a huge difference to some of the problems people used to encounter. Being able to get your daily rewards by playing the game is a fantastic addition which lets you avoid some of the grindy dailies which can quickly become a chore. The update which added underground maps could be a massive help when exploring the underground caves and ruins. The same goes for any other improvements. Starting now, you'll definitely have a smoother experience than people did in the past. One interesting benefit to starting now is that you'll actually have more choice than people did early on in the game. This is a silver lining to the size of the roster. While you'll have fewer C6 characters, you have more diversity of playstyles to enjoy. Arguably, the biggest difference compared to when I started the game is that the Dendro element exists now. Dendro reactions add a ton of variety to combat and even better, they can be extremely powerful without requiring as much investment as the other reactions. And finally, there's a good chance you can find some friends with much stronger accounts who can come and help you. It can be fun as an experienced player to absolutely destroy the enemies which had been so difficult at first, and one of my favourite things in Genshin is helping newer players get past the rough patches of the difficulty curve. It's natural to wonder whether a game which first came out three years ago is past its prime, but Genshin is not one of those games which lose that special something once the initial hype dies down. It started off great and is getting stronger as it ages, with each passing version building up on the experience of the previous ones. And besides, you can play for free, so if you're curious, why not give it a try? Who knows, you might end up loving it as much as I do. Until next time, 